These logs you see on screen are not ordinary wood. Each one was cut with millimeter precision and transported from certified forests for a single purpose, to transform it into plywood, one of the most versatile and durable materials we use every day. From the furniture in your home, to concert stages, roofs, floors, and even some boats. It all starts here. But how do you go from a rough, solid log to a smooth, lightweight plank that's as strong as steel? To understand this, we need to go back a little. The idea of plywood isn't new. It originated in the 16th century as an ingenious solution to better exploit wood and prevent it from warping over time. And it worked so well that today, more than 160 million cubic meters of it are produced worldwide each year. Now, let's get down to business. The first step when these logs arrive at the factory is to remove their bark. This isn't just for aesthetics, but also to avoid residue and ensure consistent cutting. Then, the trunks are cut into easier to handle pieces, like enormous wooden sausages. This is where things get fascinating. Each section is immersed in huge pools filled with water heated to over 60 degrees. Not to clean them, but to soften them. Because if you want to unroll a trunk like a roll of paper, it must be soft and pliable. After several hours, the trunks are ready for what many consider the most hypnotic part of the process. Enter a machine that looks like it came straight out of a science fiction movie, the rotary uncoiler. Imagine a tree trunk spinning at high speed while a blade slices it from the outside in, as if you were peeling an apple without ever stopping. From this trunk springs an endless ribbon of wood, as thin as a sheet of paper, but continuous as if extracted directly from its heart. Each trunk can provide tens of meters of leaves, but these, in their current state, are not yet usable. They are damp, curved, and often have defects. The next step is a passage through a huge heating tunnel. Literally, a giant structure where the leaves circulate on a conveyor belt, while a flow of hot air gradually removes the moisture. The goal isn't to make them dry as cardboard, but to find the right balance, maintaining a certain flexibility without them bending on their own. Upon leaving the kiln, each sheet is inspected, sometimes by an operator, sometimes by an automated scanner, depending on the factory. If stains, severe knots, or cracks are detected, they're discarded or cut into smaller pieces for other uses. Only the best ones advance to the next stage. Why so many requirements? Because the strength of plywood depends on each of its layers. If one is defective, the entire panel loses its strength. Then comes the crucial step, gluing. This isn't your average white DIY glue, but an industrial adhesive designed to withstand pressure, moisture, heat, and decades of use. One machine applies the glue like a gigantic inkjet printer, while another stacks the sheets in a very precise order. One with the fibers horizontal, the other vertical, then horizontal again, and so on until a sandwich of three, five, or even nine layers is formed. This crossing of the fibers is the key to plywood strength. It doesn't bend easily, doesn't splinter like a regular board, and can withstand weight and tension from any angle. But for now, it's still just a damp, sticky pile of overlapping sheets. The real magic is about to happen. The transformation of that sandwich into a single, solid, flat block capable of supporting anything. This is where the metamorphosis occurs. This sandwich of glued sheets is fed into a giant hydraulic press. The goal? To apply several tons of pressure and extremely high temperatures for several minutes. The heat activates the adhesive and allows the fibers to intertwine. Or once separate layers are then welded into a single piece, as if they had always been united. As soon as it comes off the press, the result already closely resembles the final product. A sturdy, solid, and ready-to-use plywood board. But that's not all. The next step is cutting. Large, compressed sheets have uneven edges and excess material. An automatic saw cuts them with millimeter precision to the desired dimensions. Large panels for construction, smaller formats for furniture, or even custom cuts for specific orders. Then comes the sanding. Here, huge abrasive belts, comparable to industrial-grade vermet sandpaper, 
polish both sides of the boards until they are as smooth as a freshly waxed table. This not only serves aesthetics, but also ensures a perfect fit when they're used for walls, doors, or furniture. As the boards move along the production line, they are rigorously inspected. Laser sensors check the thickness, detecting any internal bubbles or poorly pressed areas. If a board fails the test, it is immediately discarded. Those that pass proceed to the special treatment stage. Depending on their intended use, they can be protected against fire, moisture, or even insects. Some are impregnated with a special resin. Others are coated with varnish or even melamine, the hard plastic that gives the glossy white finish found in much modern furniture. This step transforms a simple board into a surface capable of withstanding years of daily use. Then comes the packaging. The finished boards are grouped into batches, carefully stacked and wrapped in protective film. Each batch bears a label detailing the date, with species, glue type, treatments applied, and final destination. Some go to DIY stores, others to construction companies, but all are digitally tracked to know exactly where they are and what project they're intended for. And if you're still wondering why this material is so popular, the answer is simple. It's versatility. A single sheet of plywood can become a kitchen cabinet, a base for a floating floor, a structural element for a roof, or even part of an airplane cabin. Yes, it's that reliable. In fact, you probably see it more often than you think. In that partition wall in a shopping mall, on the stage at a concert, or at the coffee shop counter where you get your morning drink. Plywood is everywhere because it combines the best of wood with the best of engineering. And to think it all started with a spinning log and a blade that peeled it like a ham. This is how wood became a tool for building the modern world, layer upon layer. If this process surprised you, subscribe, leave a like, and tell me in the comments what other materials you'd like to discover. Because here, I'm revealing how things are made like you've never seen them before. But don't leave yet, there's more. The rest of this video will be just as exciting, so stay tuned until the end. This is Nigeria, a vast, dynamic country full of contrasts, but also a country facing a growing problem, tire waste. Every day in the Lagos metropolitan area, Free Recycle tackles this monumental challenge. It recycles more than 500,000 used tires. It is one of the first African companies to specialize in the mass recycling of this material. It all begins with physical labor, sometimes arduous, but essential. Before tires are transformed into rubber bricks for sidewalks, playgrounds, or schoolyards, they must first be stripped of their metal skeleton. Workers tear off the steel wires one by one, separating the metal from the rubber. Once freed from its framework, the rubber becomes softer, more malleable, ready for processing. The story of Free Recycle began in 2018, when Ifidalapo Runso founded the company. On its site, Mountains of tires rise, more than a million units piled up, and this number continues to grow. But it's just a drop in the ocean of the global problem. Every year, nearly a billion tires are thrown away across the planet. In many countries, they're simply abandoned in open dumps. Recycling them is expensive, complex, and often neglected. In Nigeria, this accumulation is becoming a real health scourge. In the hollow carcasses, rainwater stagnates and forms small pools. These pockets of water become perfect breeding grounds for mosquitoes, accelerating the spread of malaria, one of the country's deadliest diseases. In Lagos, the economic capital, where more than half of Nigeria's vehicles are concentrated, the problem is even more visible. Old tires almost always end up in the hands of street mechanics. Samuel, for example, is one of them. When he can no longer repair a tire, he doesn't throw it away. He keeps it. Then he sells it to free recycle. Each tire collected brings in about 30 cents. A modest sum, but when multiplied by hundreds of tires, it becomes a significant income for these small-time artisans. Behind the factory, on a 2.5-acre plot of land, loads of tires pile up, awaiting processing. For many, 
When Ife Dilapo announced her project, it was a foolish idea. How could a simple pile of tires turn into money? She was considered a dreamer. Today, however, his company employs over 100 people. Each recycled tire earns him only 16 cents, but this business model has proven viable. In October 2022, Free Recycle recycled its very first tire. The process always begins the same way. The steel rods must be extracted. To do this, a machine, the 2BD, removes the metal rings in about 20 seconds. This was one of the company's very first investments. Next comes the crushing stage. The tires pass through a giant crusher, the coterie, which reduces them into four or five manageable pieces. Around 150 car tires are processed here every hour. But recycling tires is no easy task. Their durability, which makes them excellent road materials, becomes their biggest obstacle when it comes to destroying them. On the outskirts of Lagos, free recycles machines are hard at work. Tires are torn, shredded, and pulverized. In large metal drums, they are reduced to even smaller fragments. Workers collect these pieces and dump them onto a vibrating screen. Fragments smaller than five millimeters fall out and continue on their way. The larger ones are returned to the crusher. Magnets remove the last bits of metal. The reinforcing fibers, often made of nylon or plastic, are also extracted. This meticulous work leaves only one thing, pure rubber. From there, the material is separated into two categories. First, three to five millimeters granules, durable, ideal for making paving stones or flooring. Second, a fine, soft-to-the-touch powder, ideal for playgrounds or sports fields. The rubber granules are then heated in large mixers. To bind them together, a polyurethane binder is added. Finding the right formula for the Nigerian climate was no easy task. What works in Europe or Asia doesn't always work in a hot, humid, tropical climate. After much experimentation, the team finally found the right proportion. Then came the color. Thanks to pigments, the paving stones take on various shades. A first thin colored layer is poured into the mold, then completed with less expensive raw rubber. The bricks are pressed by hand, placed on trays, and then dried in ovens for eight hours. But in Nigeria, electricity is unstable, so free recycle must generate 80% of its energy using diesel generators. Once removed from the kiln, the paving stones are removed from the molds. Every day, the factory produces enough to cover an entire tennis court. A single tire produces about 25 dog bone-shaped paving stones. Tire recycling is a colossal industry, estimated at $12 billion worldwide. The majority of tires are processed. Many, however, are burned in cement plants, particularly in Europe and Japan. Their combustion is cleaner than coal and less expensive than natural gas. But in terms of emissions, they remain comparable to other fossil fuels. Another technique exists, pyrolysis. It involves heating tires in the absence of oxygen. Its advocates claim it's the most environmentally friendly method. But the energy costs are so high that they remain uneconomical. In the United States, one-third of recycled tires are turned into flooring, garden mulch, artificial turf, or playground equipment. The history of rubber, however, goes back a long way. In the 19th century, Charles Goodyear accidentally discovered vulcanization, a sulfur treatment that hardened the material and made it more heat resistant. At the beginning of the 20th century, with the rise of the automobile, demand exploded. Most rubber then came from plantations in Southeast Asia. During World War II, the Allies demanded immense quantities of rubber for trucks, airplanes, and armored vehicles. This is how synthetic rubber was born. Today's modern tires are a complex blend of natural and synthetic rubber, reinforced with plastic and metal fibers. They're designed to be durable, but sooner or later, they wear out, and their accumulation is becoming a ticking time bomb. At the end of the 20th century, more than a billion used tires cluttered the United States. In landfills, they rise to the surface, release toxins, and trap gases like methane. They are also highly flammable. In 1987, a 30-acre tire fire in Colorado burned for over a week. The event shocked the nation and accelerated the introduction of recycling laws. In 2021, 
the number of tires stored in the United States fell to 50 million. Today, one-third of American tires are burned, another third are recycled, and less than 20% end up in landfills. But elsewhere, particularly in developing countries, the situation is worsening. Nigeria ranks among the bottom 10% of the world in terms of recycling and sustainability. However, the company Free Recycle wants to reverse the trend. In Lagos, these colorful paving stones are already being used in international schools. Children play safely on a soft surface that cushions falls. And when a playground needs to be expanded or repaired, the modules can be easily removed and replaced. The goal is clear, to close all tire dumps in Nigeria. But for Ifedalapo Runso, the fight is only just beginning. The mountains of tires are growing faster than they are disappearing. And the challenge is immense.